Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis. This is the third video in my series on electrolyte disturbance, fluids, acid base disturbance. Today we'll talk about electrolytes in the extracellular fluid as well as the intracellular fluid. During this super series, we're going to talk about all of the stuff, but we are still here. I've talked about cell membrane transport in the first video, so make sure to check it out. 60% of your total body weight is made of water. 40% of your total body weight is in the intracellular, called ICF, and 20% is the in extracellular. And then we have 15% here and 5% here. If you are 100 kilograms weight, the plasma is going to be 5 liter. But if you are a typical male, 70 kilograms or 60 kilograms, the plasma is going to be 3. First, let's answer the question of last time. So how many liters of normal saline? Do you have to infuse to the patient in order to deliver one liter to his plasma compartment? As you know, normal saline is isotonic, has the same tonicity or osmolality as the plasma. So the correct answer is four liters. Let me explain why. As you know, total body water is 60% of your body weight. 40% of your body weight is in the intracellular fluid and 20% is in the extracellular fluid. Of those 20%, you have 15% of the total body weight is in the interstitial space and 5% is in the plasma. The ratio between the plasma to the interstitial space is 1 to 3. Very nice. So let's infuse 1 liter of normal saline into this patient. We infuse fluids through the IV line. They will go first to the plasma, but then it has to equate okay with the interstitial space until equilibrium occurs so this one liter one to three ratio so 0.75 liters is going to go to the interstitial space and quarter of a liter is going to stay in the plasma let's infuse two liters to this patient so now we have one and a half liters in the interstitial space and here we have half a liter in the plasma. Still, we haven't reached the one liter yet. Let's try four liters of normal saline. When you infuse four liters, what will happen? Three liters is going to stay in the interstitial space. And one liter is going to stay in the plasma, which makes four liters of normal saline the correct answer in order to deliver one liters in the plasma. Okay, electrolytes or ions, some of them are more prevalent in the extracellular fluid, others are more prevalent inside the cell or in the intracellular fluid. Very cool, so how to memorize them? I have a crazy mnemonic for you. If it starts with a P, it's more prevalent in the intracellular fluid. Okay. Potassium starts with a P. Phosphate starts with a P. Proteins start with a P. But how about magnesium? So I invented something. Magnesium is released from the supernova explosion. And it's also used in photography. Not the digital photography. No, no, no. Back in those old days in flash photography. Fluids and electrolytes. What the flip is an electrolyte? Electro means electrical, light means substance that's going to be decomposed. So electrolyte, it's going to be decomposed by electricity. So electrolytes are electrically charged molecules. In short, electrolytes are the same thing as ions. So here's the hydrochloric, give it some electricity to dissociate into protons and chloride. Why do we call the positive ion cation? Because it's attracted to the cathode cation. The cathode is the negative pole. And why do we call the negative charge anion? Because it's attracted to the anode, the positive pole. If you didn't know that, there is no hope for you. Sodium is the major cation, which means a positive ion in the extracellular fluid outside of the cell. Let's use the Socratic method. Why? Because of the sodium-potassium pump. 
it pumps three sodium outside the cell and two potassium in the cell. Second, potassium is the major cation in the intracellular fluid. Why? Due to the same flipping reason. Next, chloride is the major anion in the extracellular fluid. Why is that? Because you have the sodium-potassium pump, it pumps sodium outside the cell. When you pump sodium, three sodium out and two potassium in, it's as if you're pumping one positive ion outside the cell. So the result is more electropositivity outside the cell and more electronegativity inside the cell. When the outside of the cell is more positive, it's gonna attract the negative chloride from inside the cell to the outside. That's why chloride follows so sodium. Chloride loves sodium. Sodium and chloride are like a husband and a wife. They combine together. I mean emotionally, of course. Okay, chloride follows sodium. Let's go to phosphate. Phosphate is the major anion in the intracellular fluid. Why? Because we need phosphate inside the cell to form ATP. ADP plus P equals ATP, energy. We need phosphate inside the cell to bind glucose. Glucose into glucose 6-phosphate was the first step in glycolysis, if you remember your biochemistry. And I, I told you a mnemonic before, phosphate fixes stuff. It fixes glucose inside the cell by converting it into glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose alone can go inside the cell and can go outside the cell again. This is not how you use glucose. We need to fix it inside the cell. We bind it with phosphate. Your professor probably told you, oh, sodium is more common outside of the cell, chloride is more common outside the cell, potassium and phosphate are more common inside the cell. But nobody has told you why. I don't memorize medicine, I understand. Medicine is common sense, but unfortunately, common sense is not common anymore. So let's take it to the next level and tie it to internal medicine. There is a syndrome called reef eating syndrome. Let's say that this young lady had anorexia nervosa. Her BMI is 14, she's so thin, she doesn't eat. So you told her, we're gonna keep you in the hospital and take care of you. And you keep feeding her and feeding her and feeding her excessively because you are a stupid. And now the body which was hungry for energy is gonna release lots of insulin to build up stuff, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. Mitochondria is gonna work like crazy to provide energy so that insulin can perform its job. The mitochondria is using lots of phosphate to form ATP. Phosphate is going to move from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid, leading to less phosphate outside called hypophosphatemia. You have depleted all the phosphate. You cannot form any more ATP, leading to no enzyme activity. This could be fatal. You are a crazy doctor. You are a stupid because you thought that feeding a thin lady is suddenly going to give her curves. You're only gonna curve the phosphate out of her ECF and curve the life out of her. Stupid. Actions have consequences and so do pumps. The sodium potassium ATPase, primary active transport, needs energy and a carrier. Three sodium out, two potassium in. Three positive out, two positive in. The net is one positive out and one negative in. The one positive out is gonna pull chloride outside of the cell. More positivity out, pulls chloride, forming sodium chloride, can pull water by osmosis. In certain tissues, you have electronegativity inside called the resting membrane potential. This is the basis of action potential and synapses and all of this crazy stuff. In excitable tissues, such as nerve and muscle, you can have sodium calcium antiport, okay, which is a different channel. What type is that? This is secondary active transport. Sodium in, calcium out, secondary active transport. Quick review, why is more sodium out? Because of the sodium potassium pump. Why is there more potassium in? Sodium potassium pump. Chloride follows the sodium. Phosphate, because we need it for ATP glucose outside, because once glucose entered the cell, we converted into glucose 6-phosphate. Thank you, phosphate. So there is no glucose inside the cell, it's just glucose 6-phosphate. 
by definition glucose is more common outside the cell bicarbonate is more common outside the cell because we call this the alkaline reserve and we're gonna talk about this soon let's talk about metabolism particularly catabolism you have carbohydrates fats and proteins this is your food incomplete metabolism gives you from polysaccharides to monosaccharides glucose fructose galactose complete metabolism ATP very well done water and carbon dioxide fats will give you fatty acids and ketones acetone acetoacetic acid beta hydroxybutyric acid complete when you have glucose the complete will yield ATP well done water and carbon dioxide proteins amino acid alpha keto acids ammonia uric acid carbon carbon dioxide sulfuric acid phosphoric acid if you pay attention everything here is an acid you have fatty acids keto acids keto acids and you have carbon dioxide which we consider in medicine as an acid and i'll tell you why and uric acid sulfuric acid phosphoric acid and here is all of your biochemistry book in one slide carbohydrates fats proteins acyl coa krebs cycle also known as tca cycle or citric acid cycle producing atp and as you know the krebs cycle has lots of acids such as citric acid isocitric acid alpha ketoglutyric acid fumaric acid etc when there is no oxygen there is lactic acid in short metabolism produces acids why do we consider co2 an acid this is called the golden equation co2 plus water carbonic acid dissociate into bicarbonate and proton so co2 carbonic acid proton which is the ultimate acid that's why co2 is considered an acid it's not an acid by itself but it yields acid so in medicine we are like clinically significant stuff oriented so carbon dioxide is an acid co2 is volatile the lung is gonna handle this bicarbonate is not volatile the kidney is gonna handle this this is the golden equation so what's the moral of the story metabolism produces acids where does metabolism take place cytosol or mitochondria both of them are inside the cell that's why the icf is more acidic because metabolism is acids that's why the ECF contains the alkaline reserve, also known as bicarbonate, to buffer the acidity inside the cell. That's why your blood pH is normally slightly alkaline, 7.4. You know that your blood pH is 7.4, but you have never asked yourself why is it alkaline, not neutral, because you have an alkaline reserve. There is no such thing in your body as an acid reserve. It will be an oxymoronic thing. We don't need acid reserve. We have lots of acids already. We need an alkaline reserve to buffer, to neutralize the acid. Quick pharmacology tie. You have the sodium potassium antibase, sodium out potassium, and beta agonist stimulates this channel, leading to lots of potassium in, which means less potassium out, hypokalemia. Let me ask you two simple questions. Let's say that you have a syringe and it contains 100 ml of fluid the concentration of sodium chloride in the fluid is six milligrams per ml question calculate the amount of sodium chloride in the syringe now pause and the answer here it's easy amount if you have six milligrams per ml and you have 100 ml then 100 times 6 equals 600 600 what 600 milligrams it's very easy what did you do you did this amount equals volume times concentration boom second question suppose that you will infuse sodium chloride in a syringe and the amount is 40 the volume is 10 what's the concentration of sodium chloride per ml pause and the answer is concentration equals you have 40 and you have 10 mls per ml so over 10 and the answer is 4 what did you do you got 40 which is the amount divided by 10 which is the volume so concentration equals amount over volume amount volume times concentration concentration amount over volume now we know why concentration of any solute such as sodium chloride is measured in milligrams per liter amount divided by volume 
amount divided by volume. Concentration of an electrolyte such as sodium, which is a positive ion, is measured in milliequivalent per liter. Again, milliequivalent is an amount, liter is a volume. Amount over volume. Why not milligram per liter in case of an electrolyte? Because electrolytes have different chemical properties. We call it milliequivalent, which means it's the equivalent to one milligram of hydrogen. So, milliequivalent per liter because any concentration is amount over volume. So, if you look at the measuring unit, the measuring unit of amount, amount is the same thing as mass. It's milligram or gram or kilogram, whatever. Volume, milliliter, which is the same thing as cubic centimeter, you idiot, or liter. Concentration, amount over volume. Any amount over any volume. In your exam, when they give you like a lab reference with all the normal values, they give you two measurement or two measuring units. First one is the milli equivalent and the second one is millimole per liter. So, if you are monovalent, it says sodium, potassium, chloride, HCO3, monovalent, which means, you remember? So here are two electrons in the first electron shell. Then you have eight electrons. Then you have one electron in the outermost shell. We call you monovalent, if you remember your chemistry. So if you are monovalent, the concentration in milliequivalent per liter will be the same as millimole per liter. Why? Because milliequivalent per liter equals millimole per liter times valency. When you're monovalent, valency is 1, so this equals this. If you are divalent, such as magnesium, the concentration milliequivalent is double the concentration millimole. You don't believe me? Okay. Look at the normal serum sodium concentration. It's around 140 milliequivalent per liter. Let's measure it in millimole per liter. It's the same thing. Now let's go to magnesium. Normal serum magnesium concentration is 2 milligrams per deciliter, but 1 millimole per liter, it's double because magnesium is divalent. Nobody will ever tell you this because nobody has a clue. Should you memorize the numbers of concentration in the extracellular or the intracellular? The answer is the extracellular. Why? Because when we draw blood from the patient, we draw it from the plasma, which, guess what? It's part of the extracellular fluid. So to memorize them, there is the rule of four. Normal serum sodium concentration, 140. Chloride, 104. Potassium, 4. Uh, bicarbonate is 24. And pH is 7.4. You're welcome. I know that many people cannot sleep because they keep thinking of the law of electroneutrality, which states in any single ionic solution the sum of negative charges attracts an equal sum of positive charges. In medicosis language, cations equals anions. So, if you have three positive cations, you should have three negative anions. Very nice. So, in the intra extracellular fluid outside the cell, the main cation is sodium. Main anions are chloride and bicarbonate. The difference between them is called the anion gap. The anion gap is not an actual gap, it's a gap in our measurement. This is a very deep philosophical statement, but when we talk about the anion gap, I'm going to explain how. Anion gap equals sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate. The positives on one side, the negatives on the other side due to the law of electronegativity. Sodium, what's the function? Fluid regulation, osmosis, it pulls water. If you have sodium disturbance, the cell will swell or shrinks. If it happens in your brain, you have mental status abnormality because the neurons are swelling or shrinking. This is so bad. Mnemonic, sodium, CNS problems. Potassium, resting membrane potential. Disturbance in potassium, Membrane potential problems in the heart, we call this arrhythmia. A means no, rhythmia means rhythm. Mnemonic, calcium, cardiac problems. Calcium, of course, is potassium. Calcium, less calcium lead to increased permeability to sodium. More sodium, more action potential, which will lead to more excitability. So when you are hyper excitable, leading to titanic contractions, confusion, spasm, seizure. Those are the symptoms of hypocalcemia. 
In cases of hypercalcemia, there is decreased permeability to sodium, decreasing the action potential, leading to decreased excitability. Increased calcium will lead to less excitability. Everything is slow, everything is hypo, fatigue, lethargy, even your intestines are slow, constipation, mnemonic, calcium, contra excitability because it goes against the excitability less calcium more excitability more calcium less excitability magnesium like calcium it is stored in the bone affects the activity of transport of sodium and potassium sodium and potassium guess what the disturbance of magnesium will lead to nerve and muscle excitability problems in the brain this is called delirium tremor and tetany in the heart arrhythmia and prolonged qt chloride just follows everybody phosphorus mm -hmm is found in the form of phosphate, such as this and this. We call this dibasic phosphate, this tribasic phosphate. In bones and teeth, loves binding to calcium. It forms ATP, DNA, RNA, and it's a famous buffer. Less phosphate, less ATP, less enzyme activity, which will lead to less metabolism. You have symptoms of starvation. Less oxygen transport, you have symptoms of hypoxia. Less white blood cell function, you have infection. Less blood clotting, you bleed. All of these are symptoms of refeeding syndrome. Remember refeeding syndrome, hypophosphatemia. If you have hyperphosphatemia, phosphate binds calcium, deposited in soft tissues, leading to groans. ECF, ICF. The osmolality of the ECF must equal the osmolality of the ICF. So, ECF is interstitium and plasma. So, osmolality of the interstitial fluid equals osmolality of the plasma equals osmolality of the ICF. Why? Because otherwise, water would be moving constantly to one compartment until you explode. It's not how it works. The osmolality has to be equal so that water movement is regulated and the net is zero. What the flip is osmosis? This is the topic of the next video. Here is a summary of today's video. Remember, metabolism produces an acidic ICF but there is an alkaline ECF, that's why pH is 7.4. CO2 is considered an acid, concentration of cations equals concentration of anions, and the osmolality has to be 290 across the board. As a clinician, look at the measuring unit. If it's smelly equivalent, we're talking about an electrolyte such as sodium, chloride, potassium, etc. If it's in milligram, we're talking about solutes such as sodium chloride. So, and here are the measuring units of an amount, volume, and concentration. Sodium, CNS, calcium, cardiac problems, calcium, contra-excitability. Refeeding syndrome has hypophosphatemia. Don't forget the rule of fours. Here are three questions for you, four, five, and six. The previous three questions were in the previous videos. Did you know that now you can go to my Patreon page, click on video notes and choose hematology for example. You will see all of my hematology notes. There are like 150 of them. You can download them, print them, view them, do whatever you want. Go to patreon.com forward slash medicos.